Hey, this is John Gordon with Positive You. And today my guest is my co-author of a new book that we have coming out called The Sale. And his name is Alex Demchak. Alex, how you doing? John, I'm doing great. I uh, remember listening to your first ever episode, so it's been pretty fun to see how this thing has grown and, and the guests you have on these days. So it's an honor to, to be on here today. Well, it's pretty cool that you are a co-author. Alex, how old are you? I'm 29 years old. So 29 years old. You are my youngest co-author I've ever had. I just want you to know that. <laughs> hey, share how we met. Gosh, so when I was playing football at Mizzou, my buddy gave me the energy bus and he's like, Hey, Alex, his name was Mike Godis. I got to give him a shout out. And he said, Alex, you need to read this book. You're going to love it. And I didn't know anything about you. And I remember reading it and I couldn't put it down. And then you came and spoke at Mizzou. And so we had just connected through that and I'd reached out and I was coming out with my first book called thrive you that you kind of helped with a little bit. And we just stayed connected. And, um, you know, once I graduated from Mizzou, I got into sales and then we started talking about, you know, all different types of things. And, and you, so yeah, so literally since that first time we met at Mizzou, I think it's been six years now that you've kind of been mentoring me and we've been um, kind of working together in a lot of different capacities. So it's been, a, it's been, a, it's been a wild ride, but it's been awesome. And one uh, of those capacities is the fact that you are a speaker. And so you were a young speaker, you graduated, you knew you wanted to do this work and you began speaking based on my book. So when I didn't have engagements that I could do, or I, I didn't have, you know, the time where it was, I was booked up or just say they didn't have my budget. I would give them to you and you would go do them. And you got rave reviews. Even when you were like 24, 25, people were like, oh man, this guy is awesome. They, they loved your speaking. How did that feel getting out there, beginning speaking, doing this work as a career? Yeah. Well, and thanks for the opportunity. I mean, I, Gosh, coming out of college, I remember my senior year, I took a public speaking class and I, I loved it, but I noticed everyone else in my class hated it. Like they were like, I do not want to get up here and talk. And, and so I knew that I, I was interested in that space. And yeah, I mean, you've just pushed me the last few years of, hey, Alex, go out, go out to the East Coast and do this speaking engagement or go out there. And, and yeah, I remember a time, you know, a few years ago where I literally did 16 talks in 15 days. And I remember I was gassed. I remember I was, you know, honey and hot water. I was, you know, felt like I was sick, but I just kind of pushed through it. And so, um, yeah, it's been, it's been awesome. Just each time I just get better and better and, and through your team and just all the people I've learned from at the John Gordon companies, I've just grown so much as a speaker, um, a lot, of, a lot because of your mentorship in that way. So, um, yeah, I, I truly enjoy it. And whether it's a, a sports team that I'm speaking to or a business, it, it is really just, it's just awesome. And I just have, have loved it. And, and for a few years I did it on the side, like I was, I, I had a full-time job and, um, maybe we'll get into that a little bit, but right before Christmas, I actually went all in on this and, and what my passion is. And it's been really cool to see the doors that open when you kind of go all in on something. Yeah. I want to get to that in a second, but for those 16 talks, who are you speaking to? over the course of the, that time period? Yeah, so it was it was an athletic conference. It was a um, Division One conference, the Northeast Athletic Conference, and they had 16 different schools, um, and they wanted me to speak to the coaches and the athletes. And so I would literally do a, a talk in the morning, a workshop, and then a talk at night. And so, I mean, thousands of athletes and coaches combined, but it was such an awesome experience because this was my first time really – putting myself out there in that way. I'm a, a Midwest guy. And so you're like, Alex, get on out there to the East coast, get out to New York, New Jersey. And so people are honking at me in the car, you know, cussing at me out the window. And I'm like, man, you know, wasn't used to this, this lifestyle, but it was so awesome. And I'm still connected with a lot of those coaches and athletes to this day. And I think, you know, um, yeah, it was an awesome experience where I was just like, I'm putting myself out there, but I'm just going to learn. And I'm going to, I'm going to get reps and every single talk I give, I'm going to find one little way to get better. And you spoke on the power of positive leadership, which was, again, a great talk that you gave based on that topic to that audience. Now, take us back to you graduated. What made you decide to be a speaker in the first place? Yeah. So, you know, I came out with my first book called Thrive You and had the opportunity to speak at youth groups and, and things like that. And, you know, at schools and, you know, honestly, a, a, a big part of my story at Mizzou was my junior season where, you know, I thought I had a really good spring ball and things were going really good. My teammates, friends, uh, coaches had said positive things about me and going into my junior season, you know, I'm very optimistic about this year. And, 
And I head into this meeting that we have every year as a, you know, I was a walk-on quarterback for all my walk-ons that are listening, shout out to you guys. Um, and I walk into this meeting and I'm, I'm totally optimistic about it. I sit down and one of the coaches, he says, Alex, I want to be straight up with you. We're bringing someone in from Texas to take your spot. And at that point in my life, football was my identity. That's who I was. That's, you know, Alex, the quarterback, Alex, the football player. That's how I viewed myself. And so in the blink of an eye, he's telling me, essentially, you're not good enough. And, and he said, you, you have to make a decision. Option number one, you have two options. Option number one is you're cut, like you're done. Total, total business transaction. Option number two is you can stay on as this volunteer assistant coach. And, and he's like, by the way, you need to decide right now in this meeting. And so my mind's racing at this point. And long story short, I end up staying on as this assistant coach my junior season. And it was the hardest year of my life. I remember walking out of that meeting and just parking my car. And I remember just crying and just and feeling humiliated. Like I've let so many people down from my hometown, my family, people have supported me. Like, and, you know, I had all these ways that my career was going to go. And like, this is how it ends. You know, like if I would have scripted out the story a million ways, it would have not have been that way. And so, you know, once the first practice started, I remember walking into the facilities as this assistant coach. And remember, all my friends are living out their dreams as a player. And I walk in and, and the coach essentially gives me this kind of low task, like this low coaching responsibility of throwing this flag during practice. And so long story short, my entire junior season was doing all these small things and doing all the little things that I feel like people didn't even notice um, my junior season. And it was, a, it was a trial in my life. And Fast forward, continued to work out that entire year, got back on the team my senior year, and it was an awesome ending to my career. But some of the, I think, message that I share with organizations is that um, that year of kind of being refined, I had to completely take ownership of my life and, and the decisions, not blame the coaches, but say, how can I get better? And I really learned that, I guess, to answer your question fully, like leadership requires no title. And, and through that honestly being brought through that experience, John, I don't think we would be on this call if it wasn't for that, because to answer your question, how did I think we get into speaking? That was such a humiliating moment in my life that I had to learn from and grow from that. I, I couldn't help, but then go share other people. And the first few years after it happened, I didn't really share it much because it was, it was, it was embarrassing. Like, man, I got cut from the team. Who can, who can learn from that? Like I'm not, I wasn't the starter. I wasn't the, the Tim Tebow who you just had on your podcast, you know, last week, but how can I share this? But what I noticed is that as I started being vulnerable and sharing, then more people would come up and say, Hey, tell me more about that. Or I resonate with that. And so to answer your question, I think that's where it started. And then just learning from you, the fact the past few years and all your books and all our leadership content, it's just continued to grow and grow each year. So how did your friends look at you when you were given that role as assistant coach and now they're on the team? Did they look at you differently? Absolutely. And I think a lot of them felt bad. They're like, you know, we're, they had to continue to move forward. And here I am just trying to be supportive. And I think one of the hardest parts was as a competitive person, I had to now, instead of say, how can I elevate myself? I have to say, how can I make the other quarterbacks? Or how can I make the other people look good? And, you know, it would have been easier if I was an older coach and out of, out of playing, but as a junior in college, I'm sitting there going, are you kidding me? Like I should be out there. I'm, I'm a competitive guy. And so that was hard. And, but I, I will say that yeah, year I connected with guys on the team that I maybe would have never connected with in that way because they saw that I was willing to be committed and I didn't do it perfectly. Uh, I'm not going to claim that, but I stuck with it and, and I, and I stayed there and I was there for guys. So when, when I had a buddy who tore his ACL, guess what? I was already sitting on the sidelines. So then I was able to talk with him and resonate with him in a way that maybe he had this new res found respect for me because I didn't quit. And uh, it, it was trying, it was hard but there was so much connection that was made during that season. And I've talked to people who watched you play in college. They said, you were a good player. You were a good quarterback. So think about that. You're this quarterback and you're like the pinnacle of the team. You're at the top. And then this happens. And even if you're not a starter, you're still elevated as the quarterback, right? It's a lot of prestige that goes with it. People love quarterbacks. You are a, a fighter, a competitor, and now you're basically relegated to being an assistant coach, helping out and basically being told what to do, menial task to help serve the team. And I can see how you learn so much from that. And then you and then you graduate and then you go work in, in the mortgage industry. Talk about how that business and doing that job shaped you 
And then what led to you wanting to write this book, The Sale? Yeah, so it absolutely shaped me in a lot of great ways. I worked for an amazing company, one of the top companies in the mortgage industry as far as a company culture. And, and so I learned a lot of great things from a lot of mentors I had at that company. But in the last few years, as I kind of started doing the speaking thing on the side and had this full-time day job, what started to happen, I haven't really shared this with many people, but this would be a great great place to share it on your podcast here, John. But last September, I would I would wake up in the morning. And so I, I was doing the speaking on the side on top of my, my demanding job during the day. And I would wake up in the morning and I would I had these heart palpitations, like a, a racing heartbeat. And, and and as an athlete all my life, I've never had anything like this. And all of a sudden I'd wake up in the morning and boom, 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 my heart's racing. And so I talked to Aaron, my wife about it. And so I ended up going to the doctor. And I go to the doctor, they do an EKG and they're like, everything's fine. Like, but they said, they're like, well, what are you doing for your job? <laughs> and I kind of laid out all the things I was doing, whether it was speaking on this, all these different things. And they were like, honestly, we think this is stress induced. And they're like, you need to scale back in some areas. And, you know, like you as a competitor, I was just going hundred miles per hour. And so that was in September. And that's when I really started to think about to answer your question, what I want to do with my life, you know, and I started to think long term, like 20 years from now, what do I want to do? And a lot of, and, and you were so helpful during this time um, to help kind of talk to me about those things. And, and so that was in September. And then December is actually when um, I left this amazing company, Veterans United, that I love. It's they're an amazing, amazing mortgage company, it's one of the top in the, con- in the country and amazing leadership. And so I ended up quitting. Uh, not because there's anything wrong at the company. It's a great company, but because I felt called to pursue this work. And, um, at, you know, long story short, the doctor was like, if you scale down, the, the heart palpitations will probably go away. And they did within a few weeks. And so um, December, right before Christmas is when I quit and went all in. And, you know, honestly, it was scary. I remember I've, I've talked, I've called you many times and you've kind of coached me through it. Um, I'm kind of making this jump. But I think it's really cool to see the doors that open when you pursue something and go all in rather than saying, you know what, I want to have this safety net. It, when you go all in, it's hard to do when it's actually you doing. It's easy to talk about it. But when, when you actually make the jump and go all in, you've, I know you've done it before and many times. It's just really cool to see the doors that open. It's scary when you have this job, you have benefits, you have health insurance, you have a wife. You had a daughter, Kennedy, right? Yeah, and yeah. and so, and then you have another child? Not, I mean, not yet, but- On possibly, the way though. Yeah. <laughs> so make a point. And I have a feeling <laughs> another one's on the way. And, and you, you know how stressful that is, right? But you have these foundations to support and now you give up the money. You give up the benefits. You give up everything and say, okay, now I'm gonna pursue this passion and calling full time because I believe in what I wanna do. I believe in my ability to do it. And you know that, okay, I have this book, The Sale, coming out, and I'm really passionate about it. Why are you passionate about this book, The Sale? What made you want to write it? And people should know you came to me with the idea. You had written most of the framework for it. And I read it. I thought, okay, this is really strong. I love the foundation. I don't do this a lot, everyone. So please don't send me your books. This is because I've known Alex since he was 22 years old and we've worked together all these all these years. And when I read it, I said, okay, this could be something. This will this will be something that is, is really strong. I had to work with it a little bit. I believe we working yeah. together, we made it better, right? But yeah. what made you write in the first place and want to share this message? Well, I remember when we first started talking about it, I think it was 2019 in California at one of your Power of Positive Leadership trainings. We're sitting there which by the way, if any of your listeners have not been to that, you need to attend the Power of Positive Leadership trainings. I'm sitting there, Roma Downey from Touched by Angels at our table, all these like celebrity type people. I'm like, man, I do not belong here. Uh, Which by the way, she was my fifth grade crush. So I got to tell her, (laughs) Roma, you're my crush. And so she was really nice. We got to take a picture. I sent it to my mom. But yeah, I remember when we first started talking about this book in 2019 and just kind of how it's, how is like you said, how we've worked on this together since that point. And you know, I really think in the work that that we get the chance to do of of going around and speaking to organizations, companies, teams, integrity, which is the core message of this book, is so pertinent. It is so relevant. You know, we just, my wife and I just watched a documentary on Netflix a few days ago ago called Downfall, which is about, you know, these these airplane parts and and things like that. And we just saw another documentary about Hillsong and all these, all these, there's just, it's just so relevant um, whatever workplace you're in, whatever industry that you're in. And so for me, when I, you know, I feel like God put the story on, on, our, on our hearts of, of integrity and, and what does it look like to, to be successful and to pursue 
greatness in your career and your vocation, but also do it in a way where when you look back on your career, you can be proud of it. You can be happy. You know, you can be, um, yeah, fulfilled knowing that you served your family well. You were a great, for me, a great dad, a great husband, but also I provided and not just financially, but in ways that set my, my family up for success. And I think, you know, when you think about integrity, um, you know, I saw you posted about this yesterday, the root word is integer and it means to be whole or complete. And so when you're, when you're, you're navigating it on all cylinders, when you're, when you're truly living in integrity and obviously none of us are perfect, right? We all make mistakes, but I think it's think, having this long, long-term mindset of where am I headed and, and what do I want my life to look like years from now when I look back? Because I think we, we just see on the news, like if you, if you went on ESPN right now, you could probably find a news article about a, a coach or a player that's made a huge decision and, and that the ripple effect of that decision has, has impacted so many people. And so I think for this book, whether it's someone in sales who reads it, whether it's a, 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 an athlete, a college student, it doesn't matter. The principles in this book are so relevant to all of the different industries in all of our lives. And business leaders as well, because, you know, when you live with integrity and you lead with integrity, the research shows, and we share this in the book, it is the number one key to building trust and creating success. It's integrity. It's saying what you're going to do and doing what you say. It's being whole and complete. There's no separateness. There's no division from who you are and what you do. What you do is a reflection of who you are. And the word integrity and integrated also come from the same root, right? So integrated, which means you are integrated, right? In who you are, there's an integration of your essence, your being, your character, and also your actions. Everything is integrated together. And I think too often people want to cheat to get ahead. They want the outcome. They want the result. They want the fortune. They want the money, but they don't think about doing it the right way. They, they'll they do it any way to get there. But when you do things the right way, that creates success over time. Doing the right way is always the right decision yeah. and creates you know the right results. And yes, you can have short-term success doing things the wrong way. But what we're saying is you want long-term success. You want a success that you can be proud of. It's about living and working with integrity. So we wrote this book with a great message on integrity. Even though it's called The Sale, It's not about sales. It's about a sales person, right? Trying to get a big deal where he'll make a fortune, but does he do things the right way or does he falsify a report in order to get the big sale? And that's the decision that he has to make. And as the reader, you're following, will he lie? Will he do the right thing? Will it be all about the money? Will he sacrifice his character, his reputation for that short-term gain to maybe be set for life financially, but ultimately to ruin his reputation and not be able to, to live with himself in the process and who he is. So, so many people, they don't think about their reputation. They don't think about the character when they're making decisions. And right. And our hope in writing this book is that people will read this book and they will reflect on who they are. They will reflect on their decisions. They will choose to do things the right way, that they will make the right decision. And as a result of this, right, we'll hear from people saying, you know, I was going to do this, but I decided to do this instead. And maybe I didn't have a short-term success, but you know what? Five years from now, 10 years from now, I had this success as a result of this. Alex, was um, was there a time in your life where you faced a decision that you had to make where you could have took the easy path, but it wasn't the right path? And instead you chose the harder right path as a result. Can you remember a time when you had to do that? Yeah, absolutely. And everything you just said is so true. And I think as we are writing the book together, I think we tried to create the main character whose name is Matt in a way where I think we can all in some ways resonate with that main character because he is someone who, in some ways, I kind of resonate with him a lot in some ways as he's he's trying to pursue success. He's trying to do all these amazing things, be successful, but in pursuit of all that, he's pushing others to the side. And, and some people, it's the closest people to him. And I definitely, in the last year or two, I've kind of recognized that in myself at different times. Am I so focused on, you know, when I was in the mortgage industry, I'd get a commission check, right? And instead of being grateful and, and thankful for that, I said, you know what, how can I double it next month? Or how can, you know, and it's kind of, and there's nothing wrong with being driven. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be successful, but at some point there has to be this contentment there. And so absolutely, I think about times in my own life where, you know, 
whether it's in my training as an athlete or it's um, decisions now that I'm making as a father in business and things like that, that I can point to and say, you know what, I'm going to forgo, forego the easy decision because I have to have this long-term mindset. And I think, you know, when I think about Matt, the main character, I think we all truly can. And, and, and let me just say, from all the, the readers who have read the book so far, it is a suspenseful ending, you know, and that's the cool thing too about the book is that, you know, I think you're going to follow along with that main character, but towards the ending, it's really cool to see the, the transformation that happens. And, and I loved your disclaimer of when you said, I don't normally, you know, write books with 29 year olds, but I think it even speaks to a little bit of the message of the book, because I've seen you work, you've seen myself work for the last six years together, and we've earned this and built this trust. And I mean, gosh, if I got if I got a, a, a penny for every time someone asked me, like, how do you write a book with John Gordon? Like, I'd be a rich man, right? But I think it just speaks to the time. Like, I put we put in six years of work together, working together on these things. And, and so for the people out there that are listening, saying, like, how do I pursue this? Or how do I build trust? I think it's the the daily things that we do to build excellence with each other in that way. And so, yeah, I think just so excited for this book and the message. And, and you're so right. It's the main character, Matt we can see him in so many of our, in, in so many ways in our own lives, but it's like, how am I going to reframe the short term to set myself up for a, for a long-term success? So what did you learn from Veterans United? Cause I've been there and their culture is off the charts. Their leadership is amazing. They do things the right way. They are a company who lives the integrity message we're talking about. Did you learn a lot from them in terms of writing this book and the integrity that is necessary to be successful? Absolutely. And from the leadership from the top down at that company, they're just amazing. And one of the things that I love about Veterans United is that you'd think a company who makes all this revenue has over 5,000 employees, you would think that one of their core values would have to deal with, you know, making the most money you can or pursuing success. One of their core values is deliver results with integrity. And I think that's so amazing. Like this huge company, literally just last week, they got voted, I think, number 14 on the Forbes best companies to work for list. And so we're talking about a top-notch company, but they have a top-notch view of the long-term success that they, that they want to have. They don't want to just be a mortgage company that, you know, the last few years we've seen the mortgage boom, right? And now rates are starting to rise and you're we're going to see mortgage companies all go out of business. But this a company like Veterans United, they are, they are sustained, they are positioned for the long-term. And I think for all the individuals that are listening to this podcast, it's like, what are you doing in your own life to position yourself for long-term success? Not just like a one hit wonder, or maybe I'm going to, I'm this part of my life, life, I'm going to compartmentalize and, and be transparent. But over here, like, I'm going to keep that to myself. It's like, how can you be transparent in all areas so that you're congruent, that you're you're building trust with the people around you so that you have this just long-term ability to have success? So how would you say we should start to build trust to live the message in the sale, to live with integrity? How do we begin building trust in our relationships, whether it's sales, whether it's teamwork, whether it's a school staff working with their students? How do you begin to build trust? Where should you start? Well, I think the best leaders first are able to lead themselves, right? And so obviously in sales, like you have to be a self-starter. Like if, if, if you're the type of person who needs your boss to say, hey, you need to go work harder, you're, you know, you're probably in the wrong job, right? You have to be someone who's a self-starter and the same with many jobs and many professions. And I think when it comes to building trust on a daily basis, first, you have to be transparent because I think if we're all being honest, we all have different blind spots in our life, right? We all have areas. and, and, And if you don't know what your blind spots are, ask someone who loves you, right? If I go to my wife right now and say, Hey, Aaron, uh, what are my blind spots? She'll have a list ready to go. She'll start. <laughs> she'll start writing out that list, right? But if I'm if I'm honest and I'm open and saying like, hey, how can I work on these things? That's where we can start to grow. And I think um, when you think about a leader in your life, you know, if, if if everyone listening just thought of a leader in their life of who's made the biggest impact, maybe it's a family member, a coach. I would venture to guess that that person has lived with integrity. Like they, they've they said, they've done what they've said they're going to do. They've, they've been there for you when you need it. And so I think a practical way to build trust, to answer your question is to first be authentic, be, be the most transparent and authentic leader that people know. Like what, what if at the end of your career, if you just imagine like your retirement party someday where there's people are eating cake and celebrating, what if people were like, man, you know, John was one of the most authentic people 
that I knew, like I, I could trust him. He was there for me. Like, I just think that would be such a cool thing to be able to have people say about you at the end of your life, at the end of your, your career. So I think, you know, in the words of John, John Maxwell, when you kind of reverse engineer it, begin with the end in mind, if you kind of reverse engineer that, well, what does that practically look like? It means like daily showing up, doing the work with excellence, not always having the right answers, even if you're the leader, not always having the right answers, but saying, you know what, I'm going to be transparent and be authentic enough to listen to the people I work with, to give them respect, to allow them to have a, a seat at the table. And I think when you do that, it, you, people can't help but trust you. They can't help but root for you because you're just this positive person who just who just daily just tries to build, you, you edify others, you build others up because we live in this culture and society where people are just tearing each other down. You know, you could, you know, you could just look on social media for five minutes and less than five minutes, maybe five scrolls, right? And you would just see things that are divisive. And so what would it look like for you, not, not you, but all of us to, to be leaders who said, you know what, I'm not going to tear others down. I'm going to build others up. And I think when you do that and have that mindset, again, we're not perfect, but when you do that, people can't help, but trust you and, and, and buy into whatever you're selling. Because this is about integrity. We have to say that actually the quote that you just shared actually started with Stephen Covey. He said initially, begin with the end in mind. And so that was the originator of that. I believe he shared it with Seven Habits of Highly Effective okay. People, where he talked about beginning with the end in mind. But yeah, thinking about you know how you want to be perceived, what you want people to say about you, think about you, your reputation, and ultimately you know live in such a way that people will recognize the integrity that you have in how you do things. I think both of us are, are very similar to that. That's why we wrote this book. The thing that really <clears throat> bothers me the most is when someone attacks my integrity of who I am, you know, when they say, oh, you're not this. No, no, I am this. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm always direct and honest and I will always be transparent and tell you what I think as I have over the last two years, I've been very bold and honest about, you know, my positions and, you know, for, for mandates and things like that. It was very honest. And I said, you can disagree me, disagree with me. And that's okay. I, I'll still be your friend, but this is what I believe. I'm going to stand by that. I think a lot of people, even if they disagree with me, I think a lot of people at least still gain trust from me and didn't lose, lose that trust because I was honest and transparent. So I think we need to say living a life integrity doesn't mean everyone's going to agree with you all the time. It yep. means they know what they can expect from you and you actually deliver on your promises and you deliver based on what you're going to talk, based on what you already said you were going to do, and then you do it. The thing that bothers me the most, Alex, what bothers you the most? The thing that bothers me the most is when someone doesn't deliver on their promises. When they say they're going to do something and they don't do it, that's the one thing that really bothers me. I think it bothers a lot of people. Like The minute you do that, I will not do business with you. If I can't trust you, I'm done. How about you? What bothers you the most? Well, what you just said is probably how most people think, you know, and that and that's so true. I think I think about people who kind of uh, maybe have risen to a pinnacle of success where they almost feel untouchable or they're entitled. And I think that's where a lot of us get into trouble is we think like, well, I've arrived. So because I've gotten to this level of my career, well, I don't need kind of these basic things anymore. I, I've 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 moved on from them. And so, yeah, to answer your question, man, that, that bothers the heck out of me. And so I, I know when I think about myself, I never want to be that uh, in my future or, and hopefully I'm not that now. I want to be someone who's authentic and is like, you know what, even if I have this success, like it's, I'm not going to let it affect my soul, you know, in that way. So now you, you've written the sale, we've written it together. It comes out April 26th. Okay. The book's going to be out. People are going to be reading it. What do you hope they take away from it? And what do you want ultimately to be your legacy with this book? Mm, that's a great question. And, you know, I've already had a few people who have reached out and said, Hey, I was in tears after, after reading the book and at the end, and that that's like, so it's humbling for me to hear that and uh, to be your co-author on this book. And I think, when I think about the legacy of this book, I think we've said it multiple times on here. It's no one's perfect, but what would it look like to take a few of these principles about integrity you know, whether it's building trust, creating a successful uh, future in, in, in the way that you're building the foundation of your life. I think that's the, the takeaway that I think about is, you know, when you look at your life, what is what is your life built upon? And I think a lot of people who um, have success from the world's eyes, 
their their life is not built on a strong foundation. And, you know, for me, that's my faith. And and um, for some people, maybe it's something else. But my encouragement is when when you have this strong foundation in your life, when a storm comes, you're good, right? When a recession hits, you're solid, you're strong. But for the people who just who don't really have these principles in their lives, or whether it's a mission statement or core values or things that they depend on, whether it's their faith or other things, man, when time gets tough, unfortunately, a lot of those people, they they just they don't have the bandwidth, they don't have the wherewithal, they don't have the foundation in place to continue moving forward. And so I think, gosh, when I think about people, whether it's uh, business leaders, um, athletes, people that read this book, I'm just so excited for hopefully the change and, and some of the ways they can resonate with the characters of just some of the profound things that you'll see in there about, um, you know, living your life in a way that's intentional. And I think intentionality, I think that's just such a, a theme around this book of, of living your life in a way that when you look back, you're, you're going to be just fulfilled. And not only you guys dressed on the last podcast, I'm always happy, but fulfilled. You're going to live in a way where you have contentment and you can look back and be proud of the way that you did things. Yeah, you could sleep well at night. I think that's important. I remember I was in the restaurant business years ago. I was in my 20s. I'm in Atlanta. And there was a guy who owned a bar next to us. And the guy was always sweating profusely. And one guy pointed out, the guy's always sweating because he's always lying and because he's stealing money from his partners. And the guy clearly wasn't living well, wasn't making the right decisions, wasn't living with integrity and probably didn't sleep well at night. And I think when you do the right thing, you know, you could sleep well at night, which actually goes a long way for your health and long-term success. You feel good about yourself. Like I, when I go to bed, I can sleep well at night because I know that I did the right thing and made the right decision. I think that's important when you're living a life integrity. Commitment is not always convenient. Doing the right thing is not always popular and it's not always beneficial to you. Sometimes and many times it will cost you. Mm. But even though it costs you in the short run, in the long run, I truly believe it will pay off. You're investing in today and it's costing you something today, but it pays a huge dividend in the long run when you do the right things over time. That's what integrity is all about, doing the right things over time. I have really purposely tried to live my life this way and run my business this way. If someone, for instance, not happy with a talk, right? Fine, don't pay me. If they weren't happy with a book, okay, well, then you really don't want it and you're really disappointed. Okay, we'll refund your money. I mean, as an author, we make about a dollar or two dollars a book. The publisher makes the money, but we'll refund it. You know, here, here you go. Like doing things the right way over time, I think is 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 important. If you have an unhappy customer, again, it doesn't mean you're perfect, you make mistakes, but then you rectify it and you make sure that you address people and you deal with your customers in a in a positive way, you value them. And you do the right thing. You don't try to make that short-term game. We're about to launch an NFT, right? We're coming out with an NFT. This first NFT that we do where if you buy 11 books, you get a free NFT. That free NFT is not is now going to allow you when you get that NFT to have something of value associated with. So what happens is everyone's going to get an NFT. Then if they buy the 11 books, then out of all those NFTs, there's a randomizer that associates with one of the reward or prizes associated with the NFT and it's randomly assigned. So you're holding this NFT, next thing you know, boom, it's now assigned and you will have something of value. You may have a free virtual keynote with Alex Demchak as a result of that, right? Say a $10,000 value right there. You just got that NFT. Someone else will have a keynote with me, or maybe they'll be able to go with me to one of my speaking engagements, one of the sports teams. That's going to be an NFT. We're doing that. So what we're really doing here is a lot of times people do NFT drops and it's all about selling artwork, collectibles. The first thing we're doing here is where we're really not going to make money from this. This is not about making money from an NFT. It's about, it's giving value and providing value and giving it away and building community. Again, a very different approach. People are like, wow, what you're doing is is really cool. Now, yeah, people will buy books, they'll buy 11 books and there'll be there'll be gains from that, but nothing compared to the value of the NFTs that people are going to get. So, it's going to be exciting to see again how it rolls yeah. out, how we do it, but it, but it's a it's a new thing that we're doing, but again, it's not about how much money can we make? Because some people do these NFT drops, they make all this money and then they walk away and they don't build community. They sell as much as they can get and you never hear from those people again. 
It's about building long-term value, doing the right things over time. Like I wrote about in The Carpenter, you love, you serve, you care. And I would add now with this book, do it with integrity. You love serving care, do it with integrity from the sale. And you create a life that will create exponential success when you do the, the right thing over time. You fired up about the NFT? Let's go, man. I love it. I'm so excited. I have friends reaching out even this morning about seeing your tweet about it. So yeah, super excited. And yeah, I, I love even the example you gave of the guy, you're the guy who was always sweating. It's like, you know, um, when I think about like telling the truth, like being truthful and who you are and standing for what you believe in, like that doesn't require any maintenance, right? You, like you said, you sleep well at night, but when you're living a lie, you are sweating. And so I love that. I love the NFT. Yeah. Super exciting times with all this stuff going on. I remember I lied to my mom once when I was younger and she said, don't lie to me. She said, don't ever lie to me again. She had a very strong Long Island, New York accent. She said it like this. And she said, don't ever do it again. She said, if you lie to me, I can't trust you. And so if I can't trust you, we can't have a relationship. So don't lie to me. And it's so true, right? If you lie, there's no trust. Without trust, there's no great relationship. But if you have trust, you can have a great relationship. I never lied to my mother again after that. Even if the news was bad, even if I had to tell her something that wasn't good, I told her the truth, right? And I didn't lie. And I think that's that's really important. Alex, you give talks now all over. You left your job. Everyone, hey, he left his job. So you know what that means? You need to hire Alex for your next keynote. Bring Alex in. He's got a wife. He's got a daughter. He's got another one on the way, no doubt, very soon. So, so we, we need to make sure that he does really well with this. Alex, and all kidding aside, you're obviously getting a lot of requests to speak about the sale. Does that fire you up to get out there and, and do all these engagements now where people want you to talk about the message in this book? Yeah, you're my full-time sales rep now. It sounds like thanks for that promo there. But yeah, no, it's it's been it's been amazing and yeah, love just traveling all over the place and it's been just so yeah, so fun. Have have a huge month coming up next month. We'll be all over the place and yeah, I just love working with even if it's a small group. Like I had a, a company reach out yesterday and said, "Hey, we have 10 people. We want you to do a, a workshop." And I would love to do that too. So it's a it's sports teams, it's companies. Just want to add value however I can and I think this book is a perfect tool to do that. And here's the thing folks, like Alex and I did this book together. He proved himself from the very beginning, like worked really hard, went and did engagements wherever I had engagements for him. Didn't ask questions, was willing to do it. If they didn't have a big budget, he did it. Because our big thing was, okay, maybe you can't afford me, but but you can afford you know, Alex, who is up and coming, and he's a great speaker. So it's not like we're giving you someone who's not going to do a good job, but someone who's going to benefit your audience. But he's not high priced right now. And so he would go do those events. And they were always very happy, the clients were. And he worked with a lot of different athletic departments. And that became, you know, something that we said, okay, wow, they love him there. He's great. So as I'm I'm watching this, I'm seeing him do great work there. He prepared, he showed up, he did a great job, right? Then if you follow me on LinkedIn, you will know that Alex helps manage my LinkedIn account. And he's done that over the years. And he engages with people because I'm I'm really on LinkedIn. And he's been doing that and he's done a great job, you know, connecting with people via LinkedIn. So he was very responsible in the small things and very dedicated. And so you do that, right? And then he comes to me and says, I have this book idea. Now, if he had not been the kind of person that had done any of those things, would I want to work with him? No. Like if he didn't show up, if he didn't do a great job, if he didn't hustle, if he didn't work hard, no, I would not have done this book with him at all. But because he lived a life of integrity, we were able to write this book about integrity. I think that's a really great message because I think yeah. so many people like they want to do the book. They want to write a book. I get you know people that, John, you know, I have this book idea and I want to write it with you. And this is not to be arrogant at all, but for those folks, like I haven't been waiting my entire life. I've been waiting 51 years for you to reach out to me and write this book with you. Yes, I've been waiting. I, I'm so glad you reached out right now. No, of course not. Like I haven't been waiting for that. It's going to be through relationships. It's going to be through someone who works with you, someone who you see do their work, someone who lives a certain way day in and day out where you have a relationship with. And of course, then you want, then you want to do it. Then you're like, okay, yes. Let's do this book. And that's that's how it works. But I saw your character. I saw your choices. I saw your commitment. I saw the kind of person you are. And by the way, for those people who want to do that book, that book came to you. That book is your idea. So even though I'm saying that, like, it's your idea. You're meant to write that book. So I don't want to discourage you. I'm not meant to write it with you. 
but you're meant to write it. And so doing what I do, I want to encourage you to write that book. I want to encourage you to live the life that you're meant to live, to write the books you're meant to write. So you had the idea. I didn't have the idea. It came to you. So you need to write that book. You don't need me. You just need to do the book and write it. And I've told so many people this and so many people have written books after encouraging them to do this. So it's been great. But I just want people to know, like, I'm not waiting for you to reach out to me to do this book. It comes through relationships. It comes through connection. It comes through people of integrity doing what they do. So I think it's important for people to understand that. So if you're young and you're listening to this and you're an up and comer and you want the opportunity, you know what? It may take you six years to work really hard at something. And it may take that long to get the opportunity to do what you really want to do. Yeah. And, and John, I don't know if I've even told you this before, but just on that piece, um, you know, I remember being at Barnes and Noble and I took out and, and all your book, almost all your books were there. There was a lot of them. I remember taking them out and I put them on a table. And this was a few years ago. And I never even told you this before, but I put these books out on a table and I just remember looking at, okay, how do you do all your front covers, your interior, your, your, like all the different parts. And like, and I was sitting there with my headphones in, like, you never asked me to do this. Like I did it on my own. And again, I'm not boasting in myself, but I think just speaking to the preparation piece, I remember people probably thought I was crazy. They're like, what is this guy sitting here in Barnes and Noble have seven books on the table for, <laughs> but I was just studying. I was preparing. And I think just like when I was a quarterback at Mizzou, like, am I ready to come off the bench if my number was called? And it didn't really ever get called much, you know, uh, it was funny. I told my buddy, I played tailback at Mizzou. And what that meant is when I would try to run on the field, they would say, son, get your tail back here. <laughs> but, but yeah, I think it just speaks to the preparation piece of like, I was putting in that work so that when we started talking about this book, it was already kind of in the works. And yeah, I, I would, I would just want to kind of retweet what you said on that. It's like, what are you doing today to put in the work in the unseen hours so that when that, when your number is called off the bench, you're ready, ready to roll. How many times did you read this book before it became ready for print? I read it a lot of times. Um, I'm, think about I'm, think I, about the last think about even the last like three or four times in the last like <laughs> month, right? You had to read it like three or four times of different versions to get it right. Oh yeah, it, it's a grind. I mean, I'm sitting. I, I've been in coffee shops more the last few months than in my entire life. But it's just, I think it speaks to the integrity piece. We wanted this thing to be perfect, and we wanted this to be a great representation of the story and um, and be a suspenseful story, which is, I think, super exciting to have people say, "Hey, like, I didn't know how it was going to end, but this was really, really awesome." And by the way, folks, you may find a spelling error here or there or a grammar <laughs> mistake. It happens all the time. Like we we literally go through it with a fine tooth comb. So does yeah. our editors. And yet no matter what we do, there's always <laughs> a mistake here and there. And yep. it frustrates you as an author. Again, we make mistakes, but when we find it, we actually make the correction. We change it for the next print and the next revision, but yep. it does happen. But yeah, we went through it you know, so often. And towards the end, I was like, all right, Alex, you got the last two or three times. Like you, you handle it. Okay. I've done this for 26, 25 books. Now you need to do it on this one. And, and he did. And he, you know what he, he went through it, you know, like in a detailed way and committed to the process. Also Alex created an action plan and you're going to get a free action plan as an offer, early offer of buying the book. So you get the book early on and you will get a free action plan if you buy that book, you buy the 11 books and you get the NFT, which is going to be really cool. And there's going to be some random value associated with it. It might be playing tennis with me, by the way, one of the offerings oh. is going to be playing tennis. So if you love tennis, get an NFT, you might win it. And again, here's what, the cool thing. What about, what about for our pickleball players? They get to play pickleball or just tennis? Oh, we should do a pickleball too. That'd be great. <laughs> and here's the other cool thing about it. If you win, like say you get the, the random assignment and you actually get the keynote, for instance. And that keynote is worth, say, for me in person would be $50,000, say. So you win that. But you have no interest in bringing me to a keynote. Through NFTs and the way NFTs work, you can actually sell that NFT Maybe. to someone who would want to buy it for $30,000 or $40,000. So you literally could sell it in the open market to someone and there'll be a community of people willing to buy it. So there's going to be value. And once you own that NFT, if you're lucky enough to win it, now there's value with it. So you can buy 22 books and get two NFTs, hoping to enhance your chances of getting something valuable. Those are called will be called the rare NFTs. There's only going to be one of those of the keynotes. There's going to only be one tennis engagement. There's only be one engagement coming with me to, you know, to one of the teams I speak to, like the sports teams. There'll be one of those. There's going to be several of Alex doing virtual keynotes. So you'll be getting one of those. But again, say you get it, you'll be able to sell it to someone in the community who will want it. And our goal is to create a community 
of, of people who are on board with this. And we're going to make it very simple for people to use NFTs and learn how to use it. So we're going to do our best to really provide guidance, education, and a simplicity of use so that more people can learn how to use this and be a part of this community. It's going to be really cool. A lot of fun. Alex, you fired up for the book release? I'm fired up. I can't wait. I'm just kind of like a, a bull in the china shop here, ready to go. And um, yeah, just so honored, but so thankful to uh, to be. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at my schedule right now. It's it's going to get busy here soon, but I'm just excited to do it. So, and, so and the cool time. thing about the NFT, just so you know, folks, it's yep. really cool because what happened was we were trying to think of the icon to put on the cover, like what should be the icon. Yep. And then for some reason, like we thought, like hey, it should be. You know, having an NFT coin, and that was, thought, your, okay, that was your idea. That was a great idea. Yeah, but we thought, okay, like I love crypto. I'm really into it. It's 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 a hot new thing. Bitcoin's really big, right? So let's put the coin on the cover as an icon, and then we had the idea to weave it into the story, having no idea that we we're actually going to do an NFT with the launch. Right, right. And then and then we saw Gary V. What Gary V. did with his launch, where he had an, a book coming out, and he did a whole NFT thing where if you bought twelve books, you got an NFT and we want to give him credit because we, you know, we were modeling our, our launch after what he did since it was so successful. So Gary V, the icon in that way, he deserves the credit in doing that. But we thought, okay, what a great idea to do it that way. And now we actually tie the NFT to the actual icon, which also is part of the story, yeah. you know, towards the end of the book. So can't tell you the end, but really <laughs> cool. Very exciting. Alex Demchak, here we are, Positive You. And Alex, what's your podcast? Because this is going to air on your podcast as well. So what's yeah, that I'm going to have it on my podcast, the Alex Demchak Leadership Podcast. So we'll, we'll make sure to, to get you out there to all our followers too. Alex Demchak Leadership Podcast. Alex, how do you spell your name and what's your website so people can find you? Yep, it's just alexspeaking.com. So Alex Demchak, D-E-M-C-Z-A-K, but really simply, alexspeaking.com. And then you can check out the book at thesalebook.com. You got alexspeaking.com. That's awesome. That is alexspeaking.com. Yeah, because my, my last name, Jemchek, can be kind of hard to spell, as you can imagine. It so. is, right? Yeah. D E M C Z A K, right? Alex Demchek. Yeah. Yeah. So, e you know, hard to spell, but uh, easy to remember once you know it. And it's actually, actually Ukrainian. Ukraine. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Cool. yeah. So, you have family yeah. there? I do distant relatives, but yeah, it's just, I mean, gosh, just looking at the news, it really puts things in perspective, right? All the, all the worries we think we have over here. It's like, wow. So it's right. really crazy. Big time, big time. Yeah. Well, God bless them, you know, and your relatives that, that are there. Yeah. So, so cool that you're Ukrainian. Alex yeah. Demchak, alexspeaking.com. And again, the, the book website is the salebook.com. That's the sale book. Dot com And you can go there to, to order and get a copy of the book, get 11 copies for an NFT. If you get one, you can get the action plan with it. Thank you for partaking in this launch with us. Uh, we'd love for you to read the book. We'd love for your comments. We want to hear your feedback. So let us know what you think. And if you don't like it, just blame Alex. But if you... <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I'll, I'll take all the blame, baby. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. We do this together. If you don't like it, tell us. If you love it, tell us. We think you'll love it. It's a great story. We've got a lot of great feedback so far. We've got some great, great endorsements from Dave Ramsey and uh, Jamie Kern Lima, Ed Milet, like some of the best endorsements I've ever gotten. So great job on that, Alex. Yeah. And Alex, push, Alex, you know, you work with younger people, they'll they'll push you. Because in, in my previous books, I didn't really get endorsements lately because, you know, just to get endorsements, you have to ask people and people are busy and I don't want to bother people. But Alex was like, no, this is my first book. I, You know, like, well, my second book, my first really yeah. big book. I want, yeah. I want to get some endorsements. I'm like, all right, let's do it. And we wound up getting these amazing endorsements. So great job, Alex. Yeah, let's go. Alex, is there anything you want to ask me as we, as we say goodbye? Gosh, John, what is it like from your perspective? So you're, this will be book number 26. Yep. So what is it like for people out there that are going, man, I, I'd love to write a book someday. Don't know where to start. Um, yeah. What would you tell someone who has zero books, which is totally fine, but maybe they aspire to do that. What would be your encouragement of someone who now you're about to drop book number 26? You know, for me, someone the other day asked, does it ever get boring? And the question is no, because when you're driven by your purpose and mm -hmm. mission, it doesn't get boring. But I got to be honest, like this is my 26th book and I'm really excited about this book. It's very different. It's not like my other books. So that's exciting. Yeah. That's cool. It will reach a different market, I believe, in many ways, just because of the topic, the yeah. crypto tie-in. I think it's going to appeal to some younger readers as well, which is going to be good. So I love that. But 
I feel like, you know, the veteran who wants to see this for you, like I'm excited on what it's going to do for you and your career. So in doing this book, it's like, okay, yeah, I've had all the success with energy bus and training camp. I want this to be a great success for you, for your entry into this world and the work that you're doing. So what gets me most excited now is to see, you know, our team members like you thriving and doing well. It's seeing Amy Kelly and Julie Nee and Thomas Williams and Jim Van Allen and, and all the members of our team, you know, Kate Lavelle doing great things, seeing my daughter now speaking and getting yeah. out there. And she's now like the age that you were when you first started and she's yeah. getting started out doing this. So I love seeing people grow and doing this work. So seeing you now go speak, quitting your job and go do this and being bold, like that is what fires me up. And I really want the success of this book for you. Just like Sean McVay said on the podcast, which you'll get to hear soon. He said he wanted success for Matthew Stafford. He mm -hmm. wanted success for, for Andrew Whitworth. He wanted success for Jalen Ramsey and, and the guys on the team and Cooper Cup. He wanted success for them and Aaron Donald. He wanted them to be successful. And even though it was his first Super Bowl, right? He wanted the success more for them. And I would say that's what I want for you. So, wow. so that's what I'm looking forward to with this book. I'm excited about it. Yes, yeah, 26, but... It's always a new one. And if you had a, a 26 baby, you wouldn't say, oh, we've earned 25. You know, this one doesn't matter. No, you know, it's, it's like your 26, you know, you're giving birth to this 26 project that you have coming out. That's going to be out there. It's going to be a written form and audio form and people are going to be listening to it and reading it and you want to make an impact with it. So that's, that's our goal. So awesome. Thanks, brother. Well, Alex, it's been great to do this book with you. It really has been a great joy. It's been a great project. It's been a lot of fun. It's going to be a blast to see it come out. And you'll have that special feeling on release day like no other. So wow. everyone, we want to hear from you. Let us know. AlexSpeaking.com or JohnGordon.com or TheSaleBook.com. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, John. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Positive University Podcast. If you found value from it, please share it with a friend. You can post on social and be sure to tag at John Gordon 11. Make sure you also subscribe so you get notified each week as a new episode releases. You can subscribe, rate, and review in iTunes or wherever you listen. We'd be extremely grateful for that as your reviews help encourage others to listen in. So until next time, stay positive and remember the best is yet to come.